Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Box Report, episode 359. I am your host, Michael. Uh, my sincerest apologies for beginning things off late. Uh, emergency meeting, some breaking news regarding Amir Khan. Uh, so that's the reason for, for that, for those who are unaware. Uh, Amir Khan uh, posted on his on social media, Twitter specifically, that uh, he and his wife were robbed at gunpoint in East London, um, had a watch. Uh, his watch was taken from him. Fortunately, him and his wife are, only, are okay and safe. But again, um, Amir Khan just reported uh, breaking news that 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 he was victim of, of a robbery out there in, in East London. Um, for those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, live YouTube show, podcast, and site discussing all things boxing. The model is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is, if it concerns the sweet science, it will get discussed. Uh, for those who want to find out any and all information on the show, uh, the site is the place to go to, p4pboxreport. Uh, dot com. If you want to email us, you can do so at p4pboxing at p4pboxingreport.com. On the site itself, you'll have links to where to follow us, where to catch us all over the socials. Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, IG, YouTube. Also links to where to find the show all over the podcast realm, be it uh, Apple uh, uh, Podcasts, uh, be it uh Google Podcast, be it Anchor, anywhere and everywhere else in between. Um, cash me a PayPal donation link for those who want to donate. And then also, again, even though I'm not a beach body coach right now, I still suggest you check out the link Beach Body on Demand if you want to get your body right during for the summer. Um, if you look, Beach Body on Demand provides all fitness programs, whatever goals you are trying to attain. Um, if you're interested in a boxing-based program specifically, may I suggest check out 10 Rounds on there, which is a program three days a week you do boxing-based cardio, two days a week you do resistance weight training. So please check out Beach Body On Demand. Um, for not for nothing, just check uh, take advantage of the two-week trial. For two weeks, you can get, if you sign up for the two-week trial, you get free access to all programs on beach body on demand let's get things going i'm uh, going to split these fights up because we started things so late uh begin the show with ladies first always i'm going to you get to talk about the big fight uh the big big fight that took place this weekend the return of one Harold spence down in arlington texas um unification bout spence wbc ibf champion at 147 fighting wba champion ugas and uh rousing return here gail as and i'll get jacob in this discussion as well um spence for me it was a real, real, real overall i should say it was a really really good fight really really an entertaining fight mm -hmm. spence got out to a good start ugas was right there with him i didn't think he always fought i didn't think he fought the most intelligent fight in general uh he had his moments seems to put Spence on the back of his heels in, in round six. The following round, round seven, Spence caught him with an uppercut right on the eye, and you, Ugas was visibly affected. It turned out it was a, a fractured orbital bone. From that point on, uh, the truth really took over uh, a rousing conclusion. And overall, he just – and ultimately, Gail, he didn't just win. He wore down, overwhelmed Uma. Ugas and beat him up. Uh, for those who think he may have lost something, uh, he may have, but it wasn't much. And it certainly showed in, in this fight with Ugas is that uh, uh, a lot of the things that we remember him from prior to these layoffs, it's still there. It's still there. If he's lost anything, damn. <laughs> How good was he to begin with if he's lost anything? You know, to me, I can't help but think that his trials, his accident, his injury has made him feel a sense of urgency, really put his skills together in a purposeful way. You know, I think it was almost too easy for him before. Now, you know, he's learned some hard lessons and, and he has admitted it. That I, he is he's far more focused. He's using every bit of his skill set. And 
Oh my God, he did take a very good fighter apart in your Dennis Ugas. No shame on Ugas for the effort, especially after we learned about the broken orbital bone. And it's the same thing that he did against Sean Porter, against Garcia. Every test has been passed and he's increasingly passing them with higher and higher marks really a good performance you know, he just didn't give Ugas any opportunity to get at him at all and had enough offensive firepower outlanded him I don't know if it was three to one it was certainly two to one especially after the middle rounds of the fight it does just simply take control and in retrospect your favorite referee, Michael, your very favorite Texas referee, actually made a very good decision. You know, it seemed perhaps a little premature at the time, but now knowing how injured Ugas was, it was a good stoppage. And of course, now all attention has turned to the future, which I'm sure we will talk about in just a moment. But I'd love to hear what Jacob had to say after that terrific performance. The thing that impressed me, Jacob, and I'm sorry, um, food in my mouth, my apologies. I shouldn't be eating live on air, but again, I've been rushed and just now getting some food for the day. First time eating. The thing that, to Gail's point, in terms of Spence not taking anything for granted, it includes hiring a nutritionist for the first time in his career. And I think it really played a role in terms of stamina. The thing that impressed me, Jacob, was that not just the skill, not just the ability and power. It, it was his stamina. It was his conditioning. It seemed he kept at a high work rate throughout the flight from beginning to end, and he seemed to pick up the pace as the flight went along. Um, amazing stamina here, which aided and abetted his performance, Jacob. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, Spence has always been kind of known for his um, his work rate. Um, he's, he always has a pretty consistent work rate. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's a very smart thing for, you know, for good boxers to to know, um, you know, you can't win a fight unless you're, you know, you're active, right? You know, it's, it is a points uh, uh, sport in the sense of the rounds, right? So if you're not throwing punches, you're not scoring points, um, you're not going to, you're not going to win any rounds and Spence is very no, um, uh, cognizant of doing that to make sure he's sticking his jab up, uh, putting combinations of body work, you know, the head work and body work, you know, mixing it up, moving around. <clears throat> so, you know, and he typically is, is the bigger guy in there um, and he's more mostly like the bully. But in this case, I thought Ugas um, was probably is also a big um you know Walter Waite. Um and I, I kind of liked uh, some of the things that Ugas did. Um, you know, as far as not letting uh Spence take the center of the ring and and being pushed back, because I think that's that's the wrong way to fight Spence. You can't let him dictate the fight, you can't let him um you know kind of bully you around. So from that point, I think Ugas did did some good things there and and actually you know caught Spence a, a few times. Um you know, with some some good uh, counters and punches, but he was just not active enough to, for me. Um, you know, he 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 had some some moments in the in the fight, and he kind of just like let things go, especially when he had Spence. I thought he had Spence a little little shook. Um, I'm not gonna say he was completely hurt, but he was at least a little buzzed, and he seemed to like not put the you know the pedal to the metal and and not look for that opportunity and what we know about Spence is if you give him if you don't put him away or you don't, you know, try to capitalize on that, he's going to take his opportunities, which you did in the following round and, and come at you. So, you know, good, good performance in Spence. Um, but I'm sure like we'll talk about later, what this fight really meant to me was the measuring stick to how the super fight of Crawford uh, Spence will go. Let's move. Let's entertain some of the comments we see here in the uh, chat here. Shout out to Ivan DC 24 uh, checking us out live. Uh, um, if you like what you're hearing so far, please make sure to hit that like button. Click that like button. Please make sure to uh, subscribe, follow us as well. Ivan says here in the chat, 
that Ugas could have knocked out, could have knocked Spence out in round six with his defensive Cuban style. But his defensive Cuban style, excuse me, made that golden opportunity go away. He never went for the kill. Any other fighter would have went for the kill at that moment. He also says that Thurman, uh, Virgil, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking Virgil Ortiz, uh, Crawford, Boots Ennis, none of those guys would have let that opportunity slip away. You mentioned it also, Jacob. I want both of you um, to react to uh, 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 Ivan's comments. He's referring to the moment in, in round six where uh, Spence was knocked back on his heels by by Ugas on replay. Uh, the incident may have been a little bit dramatic uh, uh, from the announcers as Spence had had, had his knock piece knocked out. That uh, distracted him. He was more focused on his knock piece getting knocked out. Probably thought that Cole was going to stop the action. He went towards his mouthpiece, and Ugas, to his credit, you know, protect yourselves at all times. Spence didn't do that. And Ugas followed up that moment by um, cracking Spence with the right hand to the jaw, put him on his heels, went back on his rope, on the ropes. Technically, you could <laughs> call it a knockdown because it can be argued that the ropes uh, 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 held him up. Uh, Jacob, Gail, talk about that moment and how much danger did you think Spence in, was in um, at that moment? I mean, I think the, you know, uh, the comments are 100% right. You know, you, you have to have that killer instinct when you have your fighter. You know, like I said, I don't think Spence was like like crazy hurt, like the broadcasters were, were trying to make it. But I do think that he was stung and caught off guard. And he made a rookie mistake and he even, uh, you know, commented on it on, you know, hey, you need to protect yourself at all time. You know, don't worry about the uh, the mouth. If the mouthpiece comes out, you know, then, you know, get your hands up and, and look out for the, the next punches that are coming because, you know, nobody's in there to help you. But I will say that the ref, I thought it was a terrible, terrible, terrible call to take the momentum of a fight like this to this magnitude to step in and go get uh, Spence's mouthpiece when the action was still continuing. I thought that was completely pedestrian. I understand that we want to protect the fighters to, to a point, but I, I just you're, – you're supposed to look for a break in the action. You know, I think they really – you know, took a, a moment from Ugas in that. So I kind of, you know, feel for him. But, you know, to to the commentator's point, he didn't really step on the gas. You know, like that was his opportunity. And I don't know why he didn't see that as an opportunity and and go for it. You know, like if you have a, a guy that's, you know, whether they're hurt or just out of sorts or, you know, he maybe even could have continued and got the knockdown, you know, hey, that's that's points and, and that's a round for you. I mean, you're you're fighting for, you know, three belts here. I just, you know, I, I agree. I don't think a Crawford, a Ortiz, any of those people, they all have killer instincts. And if, if they have their guy, you know, even just out of sorts or, or whatever, or out of place, they're going to go for it. You know, they're, they're going to see that opportunity and take it. And he, you know, he just didn't do that. You know, the door just barely cracked open. You know, if you look at it again, Errol bounced off the ropes. Yeah, he got smacked. I, I just don't think it was that big a punch. And he, he truly bounced off the ropes. To say he was held up by the ropes, boy, it would have been a stretch. I can imagine the howls <clears throat> if he had been called for a knockdown. You know, and you're right, Jacob, later um, – Spence said, yeah, rookie mistake. That's exactly what he called it. And I heard him also say at the post-fight news conference, and again today, he did an interview with Brian Custer that is on the Showtime podcast um, stream, that his mouthpiece doesn't fit very well. What the hell? <laughs> Get yourself a damn mouthpiece that fits. Here's my theory. You know, he had he lost quite a few teeth in the original car accident several years ago. I even thought at the time, what are they putting implants in for in a guy's face that gets hit for a living? You know, hockey players do not re replace their permanent teeth until they retire. Truth. They wear partials. They wear dentures just like grandma, okay? And when they're ready and they're done and they're not bashing people for a living, they get permanent teeth installed. I thought, why didn't Spence do that? But no, Spence has implants wherever he lost teeth, especially in the front. And clearly they haven't really done a good job 
reconfiguring his mouthpiece. So before you buy, you fight Bud Crawford, who you're right, Jacob, would have absolutely come down on him like a ton of bricks. I don't know that he would have stopped him or even hurt him, but he would have swarmed him unless Lawrence Cole physically held him back. You got to take care of that business before you get into a fight with Bud. You listen to episode 359 of Half a Pound Box Report. I'm your host, Michael. And because I was in such a rush, I, oh, I omitted to give it, uh, my regulars a proper uh, introduction. Joining me this evening, Gail from Communities Digital News and NY Fights, Jacob from Jack Boxing. And also joining us right now, Daniel from Four Boxing News and the inscriber. Before we get to the, the to the sixty four thousand dollar question that's in the room, uh, I'm, Daniel, uh, your a quick word from you on this fight and how uh, uh, things went. Well, the way this fight went for me, it was a tale of what happened before and after that little incident that again we're just talking about, which is you can you can technically call it a phantom knockdown. But at the same time, it's, it is a situation where both Ugas and Arrow did say that they heard Lawrence Cole say stop afterwards. So it wasn't that confusing a situation. But you saw Errol Spence go back more to the body, which is what he had to do to tire Ugas. And it's something that he unfortunately did get away from in his recent fights. But going back into it, trying to break somebody, trying to break Ugas down. And I think after that little, like I said, that little ish situation with the ropes, you had Arrow get it with a little bit more sense of urgency going into this fight because any type of perception, especially with, what, like you mentioned, the $64,000 question coming up. Any suggestion that there's a little bit of weakness or he's not fully 100%, just raise a just raise a little bit more when somebody that's not really known as a puncher like Ugas even gets a sense that he hurt Arrow. So he pushed, he turned it on, wound up breaking Ugas's orbital bone, and luckily the doctor stopped the fight. It was a good fight for Arrow to have because. It like I said, it went made him go back to basics. It made him go back to focusing more on the body, not just head hunt. Don't look for the spectacular knockout. Just build it onto a come because the bad thing is as far as skill Ugas, maybe somewhat comparable to the opponent that he wants, but he has a much better temperament than the opponent that Arrow wants. But it was a good showing by Spence. Now we just have to see what the sixty-four thousand dollars question gets answered. Indeed, absolutely. Let's get to it right now. Um, look, at the end of the night, um, the Texas crowd was thoroughly entertained. What forty thousand people in the building? Boxing Twitter was buzzing, um, particularly after. Spence's comments during the post fight, uh, making it known uh, for anyone who was skeptical that he wants Bud Crawford next. Uh, he says he's coming. For, he says it's, uh, 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 He says he's coming for them belts. It's strap season. You know what it is, Bud. Uh, you're on my. You know what list. He's taking. And he's coming for letting you know what belt. Uh, for anybody who wants this, uh, Crawford is a free agent. Uh, Floyd has popped up in the aftermath saying he would love to uh, uh, handle to be a part of the negotiation. So has Golden Boy, and which uh, Spence responded with a really funny comment on Twitter. If you want to check it out, just go to Errol Spence's Twitter page, his uh, subtweet. The fight is there, it's hotter than ever. At this point, uh, 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 lady and gents, we shouldn't wait anymore any longer. Uh, Given coming, given how Spence looked in his fight, given how Bud has been looking, the time is now. The time is now. We need to see this fight in 2022. Will we? 
I think we will. I don't think we're going to see it in the third quarter of 2022. I think we're going to see it in the fourth quarter of 2022. I think we're going to, my dogs are very excited about it. Absolutely. We'll probably get ourselves past the Mexican Independence Day flurry of fights up through September. So that's why I think we're looking at maybe an October or a November fight for big money, big venue. I think yeah, they may go right back to AT&T, but damn, there's a shit ton of money to be had in Las Vegas. I, you know, wouldn't be horribly surprised to see it land somewhere like Allegiant Stadium. That would be an absolute spectacle on somewhat uh, neutral ground. But, you know, if Jerry's World has enough seats for everybody to play and you've got... Um, the man from Texas and the man from uh, Nebraska right there with the locals to get ready. Great. But d don't count on it being announced to happen sometime in the next few months. So save up your money. You know, you got a little time and I think we'll see it later in the fall. I 100% agree. I don't think it's going to be the next fight. <clears throat> I, there's no reason it shouldn't be the next fight. In my opinion, you know, Crawford's been chasing this fight. He wanted this fight, but it's been Spence that, you know, wanted to go this route, to, you know, originally pick off Manny Pacquiao and, and you know, go after Porter, Garcia, you know, all these other guys are in his uh, in his realm or in his uh, promotion uh, uh, makeable fight. And, you know, one of the contentions has always been, you know, who's the A side, blah, 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 where are we going to have it? So, there's still all these politics that still exist just because Bud's a free agent doesn't mean that these things magically disappear. Um, I agree though. It's going to probably be a fourth quarter of this year, but I think we will see the fight. I think that was one of the big things why Bud left um, top rank. You know, he, he hasn't been as active as, as he would like to be. He hasn't had the opportunities, um, you know, whether you believe that's uh, the fault of Bob Arum or not, um, I, you know, I had said that I thought that I saw a little rift in, in the, in their relationship uh, and that this would eventually happen. Um, and, and it did, you know, it, it eventually he, uh, I think Canelo has paved the path of, Hey, I don't have to be signed to a specific, you know, organization or if I, if I, if I'm a name, if I could put butts in seats, I can control my own destiny. I can, uh, you know, uh, pick, you know, sign a one fight deal, two fight deal, whatever, and, you know, make the money. You know, a lot of these boxers, the bigger names, you know, start start their own promotion companies and things like that. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, little side money to be made to cut out the the, the middleman. Um, and, you know, you got two big names here, you know, that are, that are that, you know, it's fight sells itself. You know, it's, it's a, the biggest fight you could probably make in boxing um and you know i'd be excited to see it hopefully it comes to sofi uh here in la um because uh, you know we got a brand new stadium here um neutral ground right it wouldn't be in wouldn't be in dallas wouldn't be in o omaha um but i mean pro most likely i could see vegas a as a as a as a likely place that, that it would land um as far as neutral uh, i would first before we i wouldn't hate it uh, being sofi but the the gambling money won't be there quite yet. We got to pass the uh, legal gambling um, initiative on the ballot in November. Man, look, uh, the big the big building in Vegas will be flying for me. First of all, shout out to Chris M for his uh, for joining us live. Uh, I see your question, and we will get to that uh, uh, when we talk, Connor Ben. So uh, thank you for your question. I want to see it. I don't care if it's summer. I don't care if it's fall. But I don't care if it's uh, September. I don't care if it's December. I just want to see it. Uh, I don't know if I want it in Texas because you mentioned my friend Lawrence Cole, which he's not Gail. I'm side eyeing you behind this uh, behind the screen behind the avatar here. Look, there's a the reason I don't want it in Texas is because of Lawrence Cole. Look, there's a reason a petition is out right now. Uh, 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 shout out to Ernie Green on Twitter. Uh, he put it up, and I uh, promptly. Uh, went on there and signed that position. Despite the fair stoppage, there were a couple of shaky moments once again from him. And I don't, I want the best of the best for that possible fight, right? 
the best of Spence, the best of Crawford, uh, the best announcing team, and and I I want the best the best referee. Lawrence Cole is not the best referee. The problem is if they put that fight in Texas, that's who they're going to have have as a referee. I don't want to see it. I just don't want to see it. I just had to get that out the way. Um, Daniel, your thoughts on whether this fight will uh, happen and happen this year? Uh, I, I unfortunately have to be the cynic in this. I don't think we're seeing it this year. Mainly because of two reasons. One, I never underestimate Bob Aaron's petty. And he, as a former lawyer, he probably knows a lot of legal maneuvering that can stretch out this lawsuit as far as it can and could prevent Bud from going to the ring because he'll be dealing with the stuff in the courtroom. That's one. Number two, which I would probably go against given the man's health. But again, we're talking about Boss Petty. Now we got to talk about Oscar's Petty. If there's a remote chance that Virgil Ortiz can make welterweight again, which I do not think is the case, but if there's a remote chance, you don't think Oscar's going to try to pull some WBO shenanigans? And so if Bud, if Bud wants to have a fight this year, like, no, you're not going to fight, Arrow. You have your mandatory now against Virgil. And if you don't fight Virgil, we'll petition WBO to strip you of the title. I can see those two scenarios happening where it's either Bud gets stuck in the courtroom or Bud has to fight a mandatory. Granted, there's also the situation that Errol, had, Errol does have the IBF belt, and we know how the IBF loves to enforce their own mandatories. So there's always those scenarios that I hope we see it this year. I really do. Like I said, for my own selfish reasons, I wouldn't mind having it eat at Madison Square Garden. Because unlike California, luckily New York has gambling now. <laughs> but, like I said, the, the cynic in me is saying probably not this year. And it'll probably be due to circumstances not in Bud or Spencer's control. Are we having problems uh, uh, placing bets, people? Because, I, I mean... I know gambling is illegal in a bunch of states, but I mean, we have the internet and I'm pretty sure that most people just go through that and do all this. Right, right, of course, but it's not facilitated legal. I mean, you're not going to get the kind of betting handle in California right now that you would in Vegas um, or New York or New Jersey. I mean, it's just not going to happen. And this is a big money fight. They are going to want to maximize that revenue because Sad to say, we do not have these kind of revenue opportunities in boxing very often anymore. You know, we've got a big one across the pond this weekend. Certainly, there'll be a massive take, you know, every time Canelo gets in the ring. Beyond that, folks, we're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel. So I almost, you know, it's almost assured that unless there is some kind of you know, money changing hands first as far as rights fees or site fees or something like that, it's going to be in Las Vegas. Best place, most honored potential uh, makes the best sense. Uh, I'm going to be an optimist here uh, for once and say that the fight will happen. Uh, fingers crossed that it, in, it indeed does happen. And because we've spent so much time focusing on Spent, spent so much time talking about Spence Lucas. I'm going to split the rest of these. I'm going to try to split the rest of these fights up on the undercard. Uh, 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 Jacob, uh, you had Isak Cruz. Cruz, most fans remember, spirited effort against Devonta Davis uh, last fall. I uh, returned to the ring to fight New York as Gamboa. Uh, stop Gamboa. And the thing that I, and I got from this fight, it's time. It's time for Gamboa to go. Uh, he had no legs whatsoever. Every time Cruz hit him with a hard shot, Gamboa would fall over. Uh, to me, this is even a, this is not even a, about Cruz. You can't get no gauge from him because because 
Gambo, Gambo was so China Chan and, and weak leg. Uh, he got the win, Cruz. Yeah, but again, Gamboa, hang up the gloves, sir. You're done. I think. I mean, I would say he's been done. I mean, what did he do in his other fights? Uh, when what he fought, Dave, uh, Javante Davis, and he fought um, who's the other guy he fought? He fought somebody else. But I mean, he hasn't ever since he got destroyed by Crawford. He's been just kind of a, a footnote, you know, and we, we all know the hardest thing for a boxer, <laughs> Excuse to, me. I, I would say the probably the hardest thing for a boxer to do right next to making weight is, you know, hanging up the gloves, you know, and if you put yourself in that mindset, if that's all you know, and that's the thing that got you out of your, your poverty or your situation or whatever, and that's been, you know, what you, you know, eat. Uh, drink, sleep, you know, live, then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you don't have this thing anymore. You know, as we know, most boxers kind of, you know, live beyond their means, uh, you know, and buy a bunch of nice stuff and, you know, don't invest money right and whatnot and thinking that the gravy train is never going to stop. And then when that time comes, you know, it's hard for them to, you know, to say, say goodbye, especially when someone's going to hand them a check for just showing up. I mean, he he doesn't even have to win the fight. He just has to show up and and you know hold, I guess, and throw a few punches. Um, the biggest thing that I saw in this fight was that um, uh, Cruz was that he God that guy was. I know he was trying to put him away, but he was like swinging like wild and crazy. And I don't know. I I just think he needs to be smarter about that. If you're fighting a fighter that actually you know has isn't a, a you know, on the end of his or past the end of his career, then you know he could be in some danger, and he could be putting himself in in a position where he he can get countered or knocked out or or hurt because uh, he's just trying to knock the guy's head off. Like set up your stuff, you know, you know, put some put some work to the body. He could have got the Gambo out of there, um, you know, probably way faster. And boo to the corner, their corner, his corner sucks, man. They don't care about their fighter. He should have been. They should have stopped that fight two rounds before they got stopped by the by the ref. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. I can't disagree. Uh, I can't disagree with anything that that you said. Um, I was being polite towards Gamboa. He's done it. He's been done. Even going back to this fight against Javon, Javante Davis, uh, when he went, he went, he went. What he, he got stopped in the eleventh, but he's suffering what? torn Achilles. He has no legs. Um, and I can't, I can't emphasize this enough of the, you know, he's, it's, it's time for whoever him, his camp, uh, close associate, whatever to sit him down and, and tell him, uh, uh, to call it a day. Um, let's move from that card in Texas. Haney, well, let's Haney. move to the, go ahead. Haney was the other guy that he fought that he looked like shit again. Yeah. Him as well. Uh, thanks for the, Thanks for that as well. I'll go to you, Daniel. On the uh, third fight on this card, I want to focus on is uh, Butea versus Stanielsis for AWBA belt at 147. I'm like, okay, you could talk about it, Daniel. I didn't pay much attention to it. You have a champion, but I'm like, eh, who cares? Yeah, that was my attitude too because I was not home for that part of the portion of the card. <laughs> but from what I was able to watch in the highlights, that actually turned out to be probably the best fight on that on the Showtime undercard, which doesn't say a lot, but we have to remember now, if should we get Spence Crawford, should we get it, the new contenders have to start lining themselves up. They have to do it. And you had a couple of them already in this car. You had a couple of them in this card, you know. Depending on this, how Virgil's out there, Rashidi Ellis is out there, Boots Ennis is there. So I know it's it's a WBA belt, but we know who the actual WBA champion is. So There's not a little bit of confusion in that front. But it's good on getting those opponents already lined up for the eventual challengers. But I will say 
from what I saw, the scorecards were not particularly kind. <laughs> the right band won, but the but the scores, yeah, they were a little bit too wide. And 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 for the record, um, Stanley Elsa's ended up beating uh, Butayel, avenging a, a, a loss he suffered to Butayel. In the amateur, Stanley Elsa's won uh, by a split decision, um, 16-11. I mean, 16, 11, 17, 10, the, George, the judge is scoring his favor. The third score, the third judge, judge, excuse me, scored the fight 14, 13 for uh, Abutayev. Let's move from Texas, Gail, to Manchester, England, right? Uh, you had a card over there. Um, Connor Ben, who we've talked about a lot uh, this year and, and, and towards the middle part, from, really from the middle of last year on, on, into 2022, uh, fought Chris Van Heerden, uh stopped him in two rounds. It was compared to first round, but once uh, Connor landed the right hand in the first minute of round two, it was pretty much a wrap. Follow up punches put him down and put him away. Um, I want to go to a question here in the chat from uh, uh, Chris M. I promise that we will answer this. And a lot of discussion about Ben and who he wants to fight next. Eddie, his promoter, Eddie Hearn, wants to put him in a big fight. Uh, uh, Broner's name has been mentioned. Uh, Maurice Hooker's name has been mentioned. Kel Brooks' name has been mentioned. Uh, also Kel other fighters. <laughs> Chris M. asks, what do you think of Ben versus Mikey Garcia in Britain or Ben versus Maurice Hooker in the U.S.? Well, first of all, credit to Ben, you know, he has taken a lot of heat, a lot of criticism as he's come up, you know, there is a big chip on your shoulder when you are the son of a very famous, very accomplished fighter. I mean, we all know the list of names. These guys get scrutinized, they get picked on, you know, and a lot of times they deserve it. Yeah, job is senior or junior. Um, <laughs> but, you know, credit to guys like Ben, and Tim Zhu, and maybe it's because they have seen these older sons coming up and not fulfilling expectations. They've worked very hard, and Ben looked great. Ben looked great. Now, let's all be real about Chris Van Heerden. Yes, a little bit of a step-up opponent, but first of all, Van Heerden was, has been uh, very inactive, which is a problem. The only thing that it benefited uh, Van Heerden is that he is so prone to cuts. <clears throat> I mean, I was thinking you got to bet the under no matter what it is on when Van Heerden's going to get cut in this fight. Well, Ben solved that problem because he took him out so fast. I think he just got lay of the land in the first round and then boom, went to work. And good for him. That's exactly the kind of statement win he needs to have. Now, as to the question, uh Ivan I'm I'm not seeing Mikey Garcia I, I'm not I'm not seeing um anything going on with Mo Hooker either you know he is I mean, he is close to gatekeeper status at this point I'll tell you it's going to be Kel Brook it's going to be Kel Brook it's not going to be Amir Khan because if it was Khan wouldn't have been uh so um, elusive in his comments uh, as he got up into the ring after the fight. I I will bet you <laughs> a, a drink of your choice if you ever find me covering a fight in the future or I'll Venmo it to you um, if it's anybody other than um, Kel Brook. That's very makeable. We know Brook is bank in Great Britain. You know, look at the draw that the con Brooke fight was a fight that here in the States, we were you know, kind of lukewarm at best over it. I think a lot of people didn't even know what was happening. Uh, but they're big seller, easy to make. Ben didn't, you know, barely get touched in that fight. He really could be ready to go by the end of the summer. And that is a barn burner if they stage it there. After that point, then maybe you think about a Mikey Garcia, a Danny Garcia, you know, after Mikey's last performance, he needs another fight first to see, was that a one-time anomaly? Has he just finally lost his desire, you know, to 
participate in boxing at the highest levels. He's always been a little lukewarm, um, Mikey Garcia. You know, if he wasn't the most talented guy in the Garcia family, um, he would have become a cop a long time ago. But, you know, it's just sort of undeniable. That might have caught up with him. Danny Garcia, ugh, you know, he's even sort of a gatekeeper too. So I really think you're going to see Connor Ben and Kel Brook. And that's a definite changing of the guard fight. I just like it for a million reasons. On the undercard, uh, you had the first title defense for Alicia Bumgarner. Uh, and many remember her, her um, fourth round stoppage win over Terry Harper to win the WBC Women's uh, Junior Lightweight uh, title. Jacob, she made her first defense um, on the undercard of Ben Van der Heerden, defeating an Argentinian woman, uh, Edith Matisse, won by decision. Um, Bum Gardner and unified BO IBF champion uh, Michaela Mayer got into it once again on, on, on social media. Talked about Mayer last week, uh, contemplating a move up to 135 pounds to challenge the winner of of Katie Taylor, of Katie Taylor and Serrano, uh, Mayor and Baumgartner. Basically, Mayor wants to fight with Baumgartner now. Bob Gartner in the post fight says that she's the, basically says that she's the A side. She wants another fight before then, uh, a unification bout against Choi, and that, that Mayor is going to have to wait in the cut. Um, are the ladies Jacob in danger? I understand money potential. I mean, we talking about we talked about it uh, in our first fight with Spence and a possible fight with Crawford. They're probably Bum Garner. She probably has that same mindset as well. But are they in danger of 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 that fight by uh, passing us by? Particularly, let's just say the winner of of Taylor and Serrano, both of them are making seven figures, so they're going to be big. So they they are big attractions. The temptation to move up to one thirty five to fight the winner of that will that be too tempting? Will that be too much? Will that will 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 Mayor see that and says, okay, um, Alicia Baumgartner, you want to BS around with me? I don't have time for this. I got this fight over here. And thus, we see what is clearly the biggest and the best fight at 130 pounds slip through our fingers. I mean, I think it's a, it's a couple of things here. So I think what Mayor, Mayor has made her intentions clear. She wants to unify, right? So in order to unify, she needs, she needs dancing partners, right? So either she's going to get the fight with Bumgarner or with Choi to, to get another belt. Now, if Mom Gardner doesn't want to, you know, if wants to make her weight or whatever, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because in the interviews I've seen with her, you know, they've talked about their beef and you know, she's like, yeah, I want to fight her, blah, blah, blah. But then, okay, you want to fight, but then you want to have a, you know, you want to make somebody weight and you're talking about eight sides, like all that stuff. You know, I think it's a little bit different in, in women's boxing because of the options. So I don't think like e even if they didn't fight right away or even this year, I still think it's a it's a still a big fight. It's still a makeable fight um, that you could have in you know in one to two years. E even even though that you know I I wouldn't want it to to go along that long. But the competition. I mean, it's not like there's a bunch of uh, you know women um, contenders that are like knocking on the door like it is in the in the men's division. Um, but depending on what happens, I think a lot is riding on this Taylor Serrano fight, right? It's a big fight, right? It's, it's, it's selling tickets. It's going to be, you know, uh, headlining and, and on TV and everything. So it has everything going for it. But the problem is, is if it's not an exciting, you know, even a mildly exciting fight, if it's like one of those, like just stinker fights, like a, a la, Tyson Fury, Vladimir Klitschko, that will do a lot of damage to women's boxing, in my opinion, and whether there will be that kind of like money opportunity for a mayor 
um, you know, winner of Taylor Serrano fight, it won't be as lucrative, right? Um, so we're going to have to see how that plays out. But I think Mayer, I mean, she just wants to fight, you know? So she's going to go where the opportunities are. She's about legacy. I, I believe she's about legacy. Yes, does she want to make money? Yes, of course. You know, that it's their job. They want to make money. But I think she's more about legacy and more about fighting, <clears throat> active, getting the fights, unifying the belts, even going up and, and having a you know, be a two, you know, two division unified champion. Um, I mean, very similar to Clarissa Shields. I mean, Shields is the same way. I mean, she's she's uh, she's done it all. Um, and, you know, she's looking for those big fights, too, and unify it. So it's really kind of in Bumgarner's and, and Choi's uh, court right now. And if they want they want to do it, they want to do it. If they don't, then you're going to have a situation where maybe, you know, the opportunity isn't going to be there. Or they take a fight and they lose, right? Because Bumgarner isn't like she's been a champion for a long time. She's just newly a newly champion. This was her first defense. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But Mayor, I think, just wants to fight. I think I think what you're saying, Jacob, is that because women's boxing doesn't get the attention and the respect that the men get, that Taylor Serrano, it has to be a one because they're not going to get a pass, right? And if people look right. at that, or the fight turns out to be, or is viewed as a, it's just like meh or a stinker. Folks are not going to go back. People are not going to pay attention. It's like they're just going to write it off and in turn write all of women's boxing off. So it, it has to be good. If it is, you'll have more and more fans gravitate to women's boxing and women's fighters will take advantage like a mayor, like a, 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 a Bumgarner. Bum Gardner. It's a game that she's playing, Alicia Bumgarner. I see what she's doing. Uh, Let's just hope it turns out for them because it would be a shame if 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 her and um, Mayor doesn't happen. Uh, she wants to bring two titles to the table to fight Mayor. That's what she wants to do, and she wants to make the most money as she can by making that fight. But again, because of the lack of respect that you see in uh, that women's boxing has, unfortunately, uh, it's a bit dicey. It's a bit dicey. Before we move on. Uh, let me find the question. Let me find the question here once again from Chris M. Uh, Jacob, whoever wants to comment, if the ladies were to fight right now, Bob Gardner and Mayor, uh, who who would your pick be? Uh, I've seen them both ringside, without a doubt, Bob Gardner, and I'll tell you why. She has more power. They're both very skilled. They're both pretty accurate. They're both uh, their work rates similar, but, you know, Baumgartner, you know, I'm not saying that I'm comparing her directly to Ann Wolf, but boy, she has that look to her and she punches hard. No, she couldn't bring down Matisse. Matisse has never been dropped or stopped. So there's no shame in that. Uh, plus she came in heavy. Um, she didn't make weight because of the short notice and you know, Bob Gardner just wanted essentially a stay busy fight and it was a sparring session. I think Mayor would have a lot of trouble with her power. Daniel Jacob, what say you? I agree with Gail. I would I would go with Bum Gardner because Bum Gardner has a little bit more of a chip on her shoulder than Mayor does in this matchup. Not to mention that she does have a little bit more power than Mayor. And even though Mayor has made the point saying that the run for three, if there were three rounds, she would have a little bit more knockouts. So probably with Bumgarner. So I agree with Gail. Whoever controls the jab wins, in my opinion. Uh, Mayor has one of the best jabs in the sport, men or women. Um, and she uses her fight, her height, excuse me. And if she doesn't fight silly, like she did at, at times, particularly during the first half against Hamadouche. Uh, uh, I would lean slightly towards her. But if she decides to sit there and wants to trade with Baumgartner, no, 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 that's a wrong move. I don't think Baumgartner, I don't think Baumgartner is a A1 boxer. 
she is skilled. She's not Sanisa Estrada skilled, in my opinion. Uh, uh, but she's no slouch in there in the ring. She can handle herself very well. Uh, again, it's just a battle of jabs. If Maya can control the jab and control the distance, I would favor her in the slightest. If not, um, I agree with you, uh, 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 Gail and Daniel. The power of Alicia Baumgartner would really come into play. Uh, uh, Jacob, your thoughts, your uh, response to Chris's question. You there, Jacob? Uh, you got yourself on mute if you are. And I think I don't think we hit, we got Jacob right now. So I left the uh, news segment open. Uh, 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 Gail, uh, Daniel, uh, give you the floor right now. If there's anything you want to talk about in terms of news events in the aftermath of Spence Crawford or any other thing that's happening right now in these boxing streets, the floor the floor is yours. You know what we did see quite a bit in, on that card, even though it produced some spectacular results, were guys in the ring whose careers were mostly behind them, whose good accomplishments, significant accomplishments in many cases, were behind them. I don't think Yuri Arcas Gamboa and sure as hell not um, Francisco Vargas should have been in that ring at all. Uh, we didn't talk about Jose Valenzuela, young prospect, um, originally from Los Mochis, Sinaloa, who moved to Seattle, but has been training in the camp of Team Benavides by um, uh, Jose uh, Jr., who trains his son, David, is also tra training Rio Valenzuela. And man, did, it, did that switch show. He blasted Vargas out of there, blasted him. Think about how many wars that guy has been in. You know, he's 37 years old, and, he looked 50. It was, you know, it was in a way, thank God Valenzuela got him out of there as fast as he did so that he didn't hurt him any worse. You know, truly a one punch, one hitter quitter like that is the least amount of damage you can do. So he's one to watch, but man, somebody needs to step up and say no moss when these guys step forward for a paycheck. I mean, it just, really does not do anyone any good. I'm going to add dovetailing that. And in full disclosure, I have done work for and I am acquainted with the parties I'm going to speak with. Um, somebody who's hoping to do a little something about those sort of situations um, is Jolene Mazzone, former matchmaker of decades, two and a half decades with main events, um, is now stepping into management with a new company called Fighters First Management. Uh, she has seen how fighters get treated. She's seen every aspect of the business. Jolene has nothing to prove at this point and wants to take on management of fighters uh, in a transparent way, teach them about how the business works, prevent this sort of stuff from happening. I'm going to be very interested to see what she's able to accomplish. We're um, anticipating that fighter... Um, uh, signings will be announced later into the summer and wouldn't surprise me if a lot of her fighters are based on the East coast. Um, she's in New Jersey. However, the company itself is based out of Atlanta, Georgia, which is a very growing boxing scene. So we're going to see some interesting things happening. Um, keep an eye on all of that. Uh, shout out to uh, 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 Josine. She's the one who helped set up uh, behind the scene my interview with uh, 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 Kathy Duval. You can find a video of that not only um, here on Pound for Pound Box Support Report, but you can also find it on Three Kings Boxing. And please take time to check out Three Kings Boxing, your source for pure, unadulterated boxing information. Uh, ThreeKingsBoxing.com. Uh, shout out to the fellows over there, head of Three Kings 2K. I'm head of media relations, Bo. I'm senior writer, uh, uh, Bakari, yours truly. 
uh, Jarrell, a.k.a. Big Cool, editor Red. Again, Three Kings Boxing, your source for boxing. Pure, unadulterated boxing information. I'll go to you, Daniel. Any news developments that you want to talk about right now? The floor is yours. Same for you, Jacob. Give me the second into it right now. Obviously, this is going to pick up a lot of us here. Like, 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 you know, my, Daniel, your, your, your voice is very, very choppy right now. You're very choppy. Just let me know. All right, sorry about that. I had my mic. That was pretty hard. Wait, wait. It looks like uh, we have one more day in the negotiations between Gaio Estrada and Joshua Franco for their WBA title fight. Obviously, remember, we have to remember, Gaio Chocolatito, three, that was supposed to be the big fight, but unfortunately, Gaio had some issues. Chocolatito rescheduled, which now forced the WBA's hand. And getting Franco this title fight. And the first bid was supposed to happen today. They just now got a 20, they got like a few hours ago, a 24 hour extension. So if they don't see anything happening overnight, there's going to be a purse bid tomorrow afternoon. And obviously it'll be 75 25 split for Gallo as he's the actual champion. But we had to see how that sh how it shapes up because we got a, we got a decent on paper consolation prize when Estrada Chocolatito three did get shelved. Hopefully, we get a little bit more the same and a little bit better with this fight with Franco. Um, any news uh, uh, developments you want to talk about, right, quick, Jacob? I don't think Jacob's around. Okay, sorry. I see sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. No, I, don't, I don't got anything. Okay, let's move on uh, uh, to the um, actual fights that's taking place this weekend. Gonna not going to talk about many fights right now because again we're a bit pressed for time. So, uh, give me a quick second. Some technology issues on my end. Let's uh, focus on two main fights. Uh, one is taking place taking place this coming Friday. Uh, John Real Casamayor uh, fighting a uh, mandatory challenger, Paul Butler, that they were supposed to fight, uh, I believe, late last year. But issues with Casamero getting down the weight, uh, uh, some charges that was brought his way, not what charges, the issues that was brought his way regarding an incident in the hotel with a young lady. He was cleared of, of all of that. He returns to the ring this Friday to fight uh, Butler. Butler, I believe, is a former champion, a former ch a challenger for a uh, world title. No, he was a former champion, I believe. I'm at 118 pounds. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel. Last time many folks saw Casemiro, he got the win over Rigando, but he didn't look that impressive in doing so. Uh, given the issues when, they, these, when he and Butler tried to fight before, in the issues of weights and basically he had a hell of a time trying to cut down in weight uh basically got sick as a result of trying to uh, make weight uh, what do you think we will see from him um on this rescheduled bout with butler well hopefully it's a sense of urgency because like you mentioned the fight with Rigandau, it wasn't the most aesthetically pleasing granted guillermo Rigandau made it to the point where it wasn't aesthetically pleasing but we also know that he has to step up because of the fight that we know is happening. The rematch between Inoue and Donaire. He knows that spotlight is going to be on them. He knows he had a ch more like they had a chance to fight either one of them before this. So he knows he has probably has to step up and not try any other plays with Wade when it comes into this fight because at the end of the day, if he misses weight or some other shenanigans happen, you can legitimately kiss any shot at anyway and any shot at Donaire goodbye because anyway probably will move up to 122 and Donaire, I think, win or lose. He could just go on to the sunset and just wait five more years to go and we see him in Casanada. So he has to really, really step out because otherwise 
could just be a guy that could have been a unified champion, but he just wasn't. Yeah, and absolutely, this flight takes place um, in Liverpool, in England, I believe it was a BT Sports uh, a presentation. I want to get everybody in to talk about um, this next fight, but Chris M says in the chat that he's picking um, picking Casimiro Butler a draw. Um, he also says he'll read some other dude. Uh, uh, I don't know what you uh, that comment. Uh, just hit me up again about that because I gotta need some updates on that. I don't. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about with your last comments right there. But let's get to the big fight this weekend. I'm going to bring everybody into this discussion, starting with you, Gail. And that is a uh, WBC heavyweight title fight between champion Tyson Fury, challenge with Dillian White, taking place in Wembley. Sold out crowd, 94,000 folks taking, 94,000 expected to be in attendance. Uh, you and myself and Daniel, we were part of a Zoom conference call last week. Uh, Dillian White has been largely absent from media pre-fight pre media events he was at this particular zoom conference uh what did what take did you get from his appearance there and what he was saying and your overall view of this upcoming fight you know i'm not terribly bothered by white hiding out the reason he's been so absent promoting the fight is his irritation at his take Oh, excuse me, Gail, for mm -hmm. interrupting. I see what your comments are now, uh, 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 Chris M. And I'll make sure to uh, uh, give Bo, uh, tell him, tell Bo you said what up and tell everybody else at the Kings Boxing what up. So proceed on, Gail. My apologies. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, White is irritated at his percentage for the fight, a fight that he, you know, to be fair, has been owed a title shot for a long 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 time he's finally got it he got irritated at the money and said okay i am going to do only the promotion i'm contractually obligated to do well the only stuff spelled out was for during fight week so he was absent for the kickoff he has uh, declined to do individual one-on-ones and the truth is, it hasn't made a damn bit of difference. It's going to be a record crowd. Talk about, you know, Kelt Brook and Amir Khan being a big fight in Great Britain. This is a big fight in every possible way. Big guys, big stakes, big venue. 94,000 people are expected at Wembley. What's a little surprising to me is that although... Tyson Fury is certainly not a household word as a heavyweight champion like in years past in the United States, even for non-Americans. You know, let's think about, you know, how big a name Lennox Lewis was in his day. Certainly not an American. Um, Dillian White. Dillian White could walk down the street here in the United States in any major city and nobody would know who the hell he was at all. Doesn't matter. We are not the audience for this fight. This is a all British showdown. It's being sold that way. But finally, White is back in the picture. Yes, he did do a media call. He was very cheerful, smiling, had nothing to apologize for, carried on, answered his questions. You know, pretty businesslike, but, but very congenial. I'm sure he'll be that way during fight week. Uh, Tyson Fury is Ben Tyson Fury. He's a one-man promotion machine. The truth is, they did just fine without Dillian White. Didn't matter one damn bit. Fury is always going to step into a void like that. Now, there are a lot of questions that we're all going to have. What's Fury going to look like? Has he trained seriously for this fight? Or what's his weight going to be? You know, Tyson can talk a big game and make a lot of promises. I will say this for him. So far, no matter how outrageous his promises, he has always made them, he's always paid off. They've always come to pass. This time, a little something in the back of my head tells me 
he may not have taken this matchup too seriously. Um, White is vulnerable. We saw it against uh, Alexander Povetkin when Povetkin caught him, but he can crack. So I think it'll be entertaining for as long as it lasts. I do think White has a chance, but certainly you've got to make Tyson Fury a prohibitive favorite. Keep an eye on your betting lines later in the week. You know, if the odds swing wildly enough in White's favor, heck, put some pizza money down on it. You know, it's something you can afford to lose, and it'll give you a little skin in the game. Um, it is being shown in the United States. Um, it is a pay-per-view, I believe, in the U.S. Am I correct on that, Michael? I haven't even ESPN pay-per-view. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and it's going to be early in the day. So, hey, if you got stuff going on next weekend, good news is it won't interfere with your plans, and it really is the only fight of major note next week. And then the Americans get back on the schedule. Right. The 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 fight is huge here in over there in England. Uh it's getting some buzz here in the States, but to your point, Gail, this is really a a a local UK thing, which is certainly understandable. Uh Fury returning to fight on home turf for the first time in quite a while. Um, right? Uh I make Dillian White a live dog here, uh, uh, Jacob. But his, the issue with him is the uppercut, specifically the right uppercut. I've said this before. Uh, he's been hurt by the right uppercut. That's how Joshua finished him off. He's been put down on the floor a couple of times with that punch. Uh, Poveca knocked him smooth out with that shot, right? And Fury... Not the greatest inside fighter, but he has that punch in his arsenal. Uh, but I'm, I don't like how Fury has been fighting in the 270s in his last two fights against uh, 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 Wilder, right? He was successful, but I would like to see his weight down even more. He could get away with that against Wilder because Wilder's not the physically is not, the, not that strong. He's facing Obama Bull here and Dillian White who his physical strength is right up there with any heavyweight in the world. If you think he could, if I don't see Fury just bullying him in close quarters in the same way he did a, a, a bomb squad. Your, your thoughts on, on this fight, uh, who the keys uh, for both men? Uh, lots to unpack in this. Number one, I'm not the biggest Fury fan. I think I've made that pretty well known. I, I really don't think he's as great as everybody thinks he is. But, um, you know, if you look at those, even those Wilder fights, I mean, the first fight he got knocked down, rose from the dead, you know, so impressive there. Um, but even in the in the third fight, you know, he uh, got knocked down a couple of times, even though when he had Wilder hurt and, and, you know, there was a swing in that fight. So, I mean, we know that he can be knocked down. We know he can be hurt. And, he he's a very like theatrical guy in the sense that I don't think that he always takes things as serious as he should or as he could. Um, you know, he's in all in all intents and purposes, he's he's done, he's a success story, right? He he got to the top of the mountain, he you know got got the belts, got the lineal champ championship, you know, he he beat Vladimir. When, when, you know, nobody was beating him, he beat Deontay Wilder, you know, um, twice. And, you know, he basically came over, conquered America, so to speak. You know, he's heralded in, in uh, England area, Europe. So, you know, he, he really has nowhere to go except, uh, you know, maybe a slightly, you know, he can, you know, there's a few more fights in him, but I, I think that he's kind of like not his head isn't really in the game. I think he's accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. And um, Dillian White, although not a great fighter, also but dangerous, you know. And in the heavyweights, we all know it. All it takes is one shot. I mean, I would even say even in, in even in some of the lower weights, all it takes is one shot. You get hit in the right place at the right time. I don't care if you're, you know, like. Uh, uh, 
pillow handed, like uh, Molinology or or whatever. I mean, he has knockouts uh, on his resume. I mean, you you can get knocked out, and then, especially at heavyweight, and especially the way that uh, Dillian White slings his punches. You know, looking for the knockout. I I think it could happen. I mean, we we can see an upset here. Um, I mean, if I was a betting man, of course you you have to go with the the upset because. You know, if you're going to for the favorite, you have to put down a lot of money to win some money, right? So it makes no sense to bet on the favorites unless you're absolutely 100% sure. But that's why we, that's why they fight, right? We never know what's going to happen. Uh, there have been a lot of upsets this year, um, you know, and even towards the end of last year. Um, you know, the, I think Dillian White, what he needs to do is he he's not going to change. Like, he's not going to reinvent the wheel here he needs to go at tyson fury i think he needs to just basically try to catch him cold and and just go for it you know first four rounds go for it because he's not one of those guys that's known for his stamina stamina and uh you know like being one that can kind of get dragged into deep waters and and, and drown um so to speak or, or you know ha- leave openings for himself so i think he just has to go at fury i think that's the best way you know, even when Fury was fighting uh, his uh, kind of in-between fights, between the Wilder fights, you know, he had some guys that, you know, they were undefeated, but they hadn't fought anybody. But some of them gave him some trouble, you know, um, you know, and actually, you know, like uh, put, a, put a little uh, hands on him. So Fury is definitely hittable. I think, you know, he's he's not as slick as he thinks he is. So White just needs to go after him, stick to his game, sling those punches uh, you know, try to connect and, you know, just go for broke because I don't think he's going to get, uh, another chance. You know, it's been a long road, you know, from the Joshua fight to now it's been a long road and I don't think there's going to be that chance again. Um, you know, like this, so he's going to be in front of a huge crowd. You know, I, I feel like it's upset written all over it. Oh, oh, uh, do you agree, Daniel? I'm not unfortunately because while Jacob is right that he has some trouble with Fury when it comes to the fighting, he also fights to the level of expectation when it comes to the event. We know about Sefer Sefery, we know about Otto Wally. We know about that situation, but then when it came to the big fights, Second fight completely dominated Wilder. Third fight, save for the fourth round a couple of times, once again completely dominated Wilder again. And he's smart enough to know what fight is on the horizon. You're either going to have a fight, another UK banger, which by the way, we do have to pour... So we have to pour some liquor out for Carl Fox. He can no longer claim that he has got the most people in Wembley Stadium. But it's either going to be a matchup with Joshua or a matchup with Usyk. Joshua will bring him probably the most money domestically. Usyk would be the better technical fight. And he... and. As much shit as I've given Tyson Fury in the past, he's at least smart enough to know those two fights will draw him um, either money or the level of prestige that he almost got before his first breakdown after beating Klitschko. I don't expect it for a little too easy because Dillian White is a tough character. He will make you work for it but at the same time he's also very very vulnerable and with the height advantage that fury has it may just be it may just be enough where he makes it easier than what he expect and all then all fury has to do is either wait for the joshua Usyk fight to come to fruition because at the end of the day that's his legacy. He's either going to fight them and make more money, or he does retire to the sunset because Fury is also a character that plays by his own rules. He may say, I don't have nothing to prove to you guys. Uh, 
sorry, I was on mute. My apologies. Uh, I don't buy. I don't buy. Uh, um, oh, really, Jacob? Uh, I'm gonna put this private comment. This private comment by you in the chat, just for just to, just to entertain it, right quick. Uh, I think I'm gonna pick. Uh, I'm gonna pick Fury to to win this fight against Dillian White. I just think he's too much, too long, too too long, uh, too much of a boxer has too much movement for him again. And I just think that 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 I can't get past the fact that Dillian White is susceptible up the middle with uppercuts, and, and if Fury gets the jab going, it's you know it's gonna be e it's gonna be relatively easy. But here in the private conversation, Jacob, he says that Usek embarrasses. "Quote unquote," Usyk embarrasses Fury. Why do you think so? Why do you think that? I just don't think, like I said before, I have never been sold on Fury. I just don't think he's that great. I think Usyk has just when you look at the overall skills that that guy has, he's a very skilled fighter. He has all the tools, um, you know, not only defensively but offensively. His feet, his uh, the way he attacks, his combinations, his jab. I just think he has all those tools. And, you know, Fury is sus susceptible to being hit, to being, you know, like they all show these highlights where he's on the ropes and he's dodging, you know, all these punches, like trying to slip and stuff. But it's against competition that's like, you know, th th these guys are they're nobodies. So, I mean, yeah, you're going to look great against a nobody, but, you know, somebody that has skill and that, you know, has a good good corner, good uh, ring IQ like an Usyk. I I just think that he's he, he's going to mop the floor with them. You know, if that fight ever happens, um, yeah, Fury's big. You know, he has that that advantage. I guess a big, but as far as a height, I think you know Usyk is a pretty tall tall guy. But um, you know, he's not as big as his frame. But I think defensively, he he can uh, avoid a lot of uh, Usyk. I mean, a lot of Fury's. Uh, uh, shots and things of that nature. And I, I think he would basically put on a clinic. Response from anyone else before we begin to shut things down? Well, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I like a bold statement. I love it. You know, Usyk is absolutely, I think, got a, every chance of winning. Would he, would he wipe the floor with him? Would he dominate him? Ooh. You know, when you have somebody who punches as hard as Fury does, you know, in a similar way to Deontay Wilder, you know, when they have the one punch knockout power, the ability to change a fight, I mean, you never count him out. You don't count him out until the very last bell. That with Wilder. Do you have that though? I, I don't think yeah. that Fury's a one punch knockout artist. Oh, absolutely. No. Yeah, absolutely he does. Um, can he make it happen? Usyk will be hard to find. Usyk is going to be a whole lot more elusive and defensively responsible than the lion's share of opponents that Fury's had. Um, you know, certain fighters just find a way to win. And think about how Fury neutralized Vladimir Klitschko, I mean, of all people, Vladimir Klitschko. And Flirt, Fury's learned a hell of a lot since then. I think Fury honestly has much more trouble um, with guys who come right at him and surprise him. You know, and I, I have to think of guys like Otto Wallin, right? So, you know, it's that kind of guy that gives him trouble. I, I'm not sure about Usyk. But talk about a pre-fight promotion to die for. I would not miss a minute of the lead up between Usyk and Fury. They'll go at it. They're both incredibly smart, very funny. Um, it'll be a riot. I, I would, it's a better dancer, though. I would pull just for the entertainment leading up to the fight. With, without even the fight, it would be that good. Mm. I wouldn't say embarrassed, but Usyk would be the biggest technical challenge that Fury has ever faced. Even more than Black. Because at a certain point, 
yeah, you face guys that were similar height, but that hurt you a little bit. And at the end of the day, then this is the part that does make Dillian White a a little bit of a live dog. Is yeah, I, like I mentioned when he in the Deontay Wilder fight, very dominated the second and third fights, but Wilder did take something out of Fury as well. He did take that little bit of aura of I can outskill a guy and I can't and he can't hurt me. He showed that he can he can be hurt. The thing about it though is it's also that Deontay Wilder is one of the heaviest punchers that the heavyweight division has seen in a long time. Usyk is not that. Daily White is not that. But Usyk is also somebody that may just out crazy Tyson Fury, which is saying a lot. He may out crazy Tyson Fury. It doesn't even have to matter when it comes to talking about promotion. You're talking about a man who also we have to rem- we also do have to remember with, with everything that's happening. Fury kind of is like a man without a country. Some Americans like him, not all of them. Some Brits probably feel like he abandoned the UK to go to America. Usyk's gonna have the entire country of Ukraine, not to mention several probably neighboring Baltic states fully behind them. And that is a lot of support to get, and not to mention he knows what he's fighting for, he knows what he represents right now when it comes into when people think about Ukrainian fighters in that sense. If it does happen, I I fully expect Usyk to win. I fully, fully expect Usyk to win because he is more technical sound. He is smaller, which may make it a little bit less of a show for Tyson. And at the end of the day, even though Usyk is a little bit there in age as well, he hasn't lost a lot of agility. He hasn't lost a lot of sharpness. So we, that tells me that, yeah, he'll probably win the fight. But we just have to see if it happens first. And I think we're going to um, end things on on, on on that note. I want to thank, first and foremost, I want to thank everybody who joined us um, in the live chats for their comments and their questions. Um, Ivan DC20, uh, Chris M., uh, uh, Yolanda Cortez, she says, hi, Gail. She says, hello in the chat. Hey, um, if, um, if you like what you've heard this evening, uh, uh, please make sure to hit that like button. Please make sure to uh, subscribe on YouTube if you're checking us out in the podcast realm, uh, be it um, Apple Podcasts, be it Google Podcasts, be it Anchor anywhere and everywhere else between. Make sure to follow us there. If you check us out, if you follow us on um, Apple uh, uh, Apple Podcasts. Uh, please make sure to leave a review. We'd love to hear your comments and your questions. Or you can um, email pound for pound boxing report. Um, you can send us an e- shoot us an email. Excuse me, pound for pound boxing report. P four P box P four P boxing at P four P boxing report dot com. Um, if you leave a review on on Apple Podcasts, five star review will we'll get read on the show. Um, I failed to give a proper introduction to everyone at the beginning. Um, I did so midpoint. I'm going to do it again now. Uh, uh, going to go around the panel. Uh, um, begin the show, ladies first. In the show, ladies first. Gail from Communities Digital News and NY Fights. Uh, for those who want to talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk media, or for those who want to check you out on occasion, occasionally on uh, uh, TMZ Live, uh, let the folks know where they can find you. You can find my two columns in two different spots and they do two different things. NYfights.com is where I get to sound off and swear in addition to some fight recaps. And we'll have the Thursday night card for you this week. Golden Boy is back out in the desert at Fantasy Springs with a little sort of desert club fight. So stay tuned for that. If you want some American boxing, there it is. Thursday night. Um, And in addition, I write 
full uh, recaps and previews for Communities Digital News, which is COM, C-O-M-M, Digi, D-I-G-I, News, comdiginews.com. The coverage of the Golden Boy Fight will be at newyorkfights.com this week. And I go to to uh, thank you for being on the show, Gail. I go to you, Jacob, from Jab Hook Boxing. Uh, um, for those who want to talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk TV and film, let the folks know where they can hit you up. Uh, as always, thanks for having me, Mike, on the show, and thanks to uh, Gail and Daniel. As always, love love talking boxing with you guys. I don't get to talk boxing enough with with people. Um, I mostly just talk with you guys and. So thanks for everybody that listen. And if you guys want to come at me with the, you know, uh, my crazy opinions or, or whatever, you can find me at Twitter, JRATM23. Um, last but certainly not least, Daniel uh, from 4 Boxing News and the Inscriber for those who want to uh, talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk uh, pro wrestling, for those who want to talk the NBA, especially when it comes to the Miami Heat. Um, they got game two of the first round of the series in the Eastern Conference playoffs uh, tomorrow evening against Miami Heat winning game one. Um, for those who want to talk the Heat, for those who want to talk wrestling, for those who want to talk boxing, let the folks know where they can find you. All right, folks, you can find me on Twitter, Rockets99, R A W K U Z 99. Definitely catch me on there. So, like I said, saying things that I'm randomly say and watching things like me, like Mauricio trying to distance himself from the K in MTK. Yeah, that that issue, which is not too many folks are gonna are talking about right now. For you know, I get why, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw those comments from the WBC uh, today regarding um, a certain gentlemen over at Pro Bellum. Um, for those who want to talk music, fitness, uh, music, fitness, boxing, you know what it is with me on the socials, brother Jr. at brother Jr. seven six on Twitter. Um, as I said before, if you want to check out all things Pound for Pound Boxing Report, the site is the place to go to, p4pboxingreport.com. Again, check out the site. You'll find links to what it catches on all over the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, IG, where you check out the podcast on all podcast platforms, uh, where you can donate and check out all the stuff over at Beach Body On Demand. On the next episode, we will do a recap of of uh, Fury, Dillian White. We will do a recap of uh, Casimero Butler, and we will do a preview of all the bouts that's going to happen on the 30th, mainly um, Shakur Stevenson fighting Oscar Valdez, unification bout at 130. Shakur, WBO champion, Valdez, WBC champion on the undercard of that, uh, Keyshawn Davis and Nico Ali Washa fighting. And also, huge, 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 we touched upon it, uh, and during our discussion about Mayer and Baumgartner, and that is the highly anticipated fight between women's undisputed uh, lightweight champion, Katie Taylor. She's fighting um, unified featherweight champion, Amanda Serrano. It's going to be close to a packed house over at the big house, the big garden, uh, the big house over at MS MSG. Jesse Vargas, he's going to fight out and on that undercard. is also... Uh, uh, undisputed champion, undisputed fight, uh, a unification fight, excuse me, for undisputed honors at 168 pounds. As um, French on Cruz deserved women's WBC, WBO, 168 pound champion. She's going to fight IBF, WBA, unified 168 pound champ. Uh, uh, um, uh, Eileen Sideros, excuse me. I'm also Gal, your fight is going to fight on that card. Austin Hammer Williams is going to fight on the undercard of that. So, uh, pretty significant, a lot of significant bouts is going to happen on um, April 30th. Again, um, Serrano and Taylor and Serrano, that is going to be, I believe, that's going to be on DAZN. Um, Shakur Stevenson Valdez, that's going to be on ESPN. Again, I want to thank everybody once again who joined us for the live portion of the show. The comments on the live chat. Uh, Again, if you if you like what you heard, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. For Gil from Communities Digital News and NY Fights, uh, from Jacob from Jack Boxing, 
um, Daniel from Four Boxing News in the Inspire. This has been episode 359. I'm your host, Michael. We will see you guys next time. Um, everyone have a, a good evening, good night, and um, rest in power, DJ K Slay. Good night. <laughs>